Okay, welcome everybody. I am Christine Ford from POST and welcome to developing a training plan workshop. Just a couple of things, a reminder before I introduce our speaker. Um, it's just a reminder for attendees to have their display name match what they've registered with on Zoom. And if you don't know how to do that, I can go ahead and send the instructions in the chat box. Please stay till the end to get your survey link for the CPT credit for today's class. Also a reminder, if you did attend the opening keynote this morning, you can also get credit for that if you could please do a survey for that also. This meeting will be recorded. Please have your camera on and your, and your mics muted. And please use the chat box for any questions. Uh, we'll get to those probably after the first break and also at the end for Ron. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ron Mark. He's the director for the Center for Criminal Justice Research and Training at California State University, Long Beach. He is also an adjunct professor at CSU Long Beach and has taught at Concordia University in Irvine. Prior to his role as director, Ron spent 33 years in law enforcement working for the cities of Gardenia and Signal Hill. He has been both an operational and admin commander and retired as a captain. He has both his bachelor's and master's degree and is a wealth, I mean, a huge wealth of information on training plans. Please welcome Ron Mark. Thanks, Christine. I thought you were gonna choke on that last one, so. <laughs> <laughs> I was being very truthful. <laughs> well, thanks and welcome everybody. Uh, I appreciate everybody attending the, uh, the seminar here. Um, uh, try to make this as interactive as possible. It's a little different uh, doing this online and on Zoom and, and definitely not as our first choice, but uh, thank Post for putting this together and kicking this off and the teams that uh, um, worked on all of this. It was a lot of work uh, putting this together. So thank you all and thank you for the support. Um, just a little bit about uh, us and the CJ Center. If you're not from our region and you're not familiar with us, um, we're essentially a regional post training site. Um, we run a number of courses through us um, we're actually part of campus. Uh, we sit on the Cal State Long Beach campus, but we're a designated research and training center. Um, the center's been around since about 1967, uh, long before uh, I came here as the director. Um, and its primary function has been uh, the professionalism and training for law enforcement. Um, you may know some of our staff. For those of you that send your sergeants to SLI, you probably know Hillary Edwards in my office. Uh, she runs the place, basically. She is my right hand um, and has been part of the SLI program for well over 10 years. Um, so any of those requests that you're sending to post ultimately hit uh, our desk. Um, and that's um, uh, that's uh, Hillary that puts that together. Uh, there's a, the post management class, the other one down in uh, Orange County uh, is ours. Uh, we support the executive development course. And then there's probably another 30 or so courses that we we run through the center. We're a designated 501c3, so we're a nonprofit. Uh, we're funded partially by post, partially by the state, uh, partially by the work we do on campus. So we're essentially here for you. Um, uh, we're, we're a pretty big part of our region. Um, we've got some projects that we've been pushing out throughout the state for post. So you'll probably be seeing some of us uh, as we travel. In fact, we're in a uh, uh, Monterey next week uh, delivering a class um, uh, for post and uh, uh, BTB. So uh, again, thank you and I uh, appreciate you um, uh, letting me speak to you today. Uh, as Christine said, if you have questions, feel free to throw them in the chat box uh, as we go along. Uh, if I catch them, if I can catch them after some of the slides and I see those, um, uh, we'll work on that. If not, um, uh, we'll get them either right after the break or at the end of the presentation. Uh, I can answer some of your questions and hopefully that helps. So um, although this is this course has been titled training plans, um, it's really not just the training plans we're talking about. We're talking we're going to talk a little bit about deployment of the plans. Uh, building a plan, I'll tell you, is very, very easy to do. It's a matter of just sitting down and spending the time. Uh, with just very little guidance to put the plan together. The difficult part you're going to find is executing the plan. Um, uh, putting pen to paper is easy. Uh, we, now we have to deal with people. We have to deal with our, our staff, our officers. Uh, we have to deal with the training sites, classes, scheduling. Uh, that becomes the nightmare. And um, uh, that hopefully we can work through some of that uh, with you. Um, uh, none of I'm, none of thing I'm telling you is a big secret. Uh, most of it has been learned al along the way in my career. And to be 
quite honest, through most of our training managers. Uh, I work with an excellent group of training managers, both in LA and Orange County, uh, also out of the STARS area, um, which is the San Bernardino uh, side of it. Uh, so regions to eight, nine, and 10, I believe, if I'm, if I'm, I was getting mi regions mixed up, but uh, some very robust training groups out there. And, and that's where a lot of this information has come from. So uh, we'll talk about that. Trisha, if you do me a favor, can you deploy uh, polls seven and five uh, to everybody? If everyone would take this poll, it kind of give me an idea where we are and um, uh, we can kind of go from there. Look at that. It's like magic. We'll give it a little bit here. 240 people registered. Look at this coming in. What a robust group here. And I appreciate that. Um, a lot of what we're going to talk about uh, today is going to be based on kind of your questions and what you need out of this. Like I said, the, the, um, uh, the, the building of the plan itself, the, the mechanics is very, very easy. The, the complexity is in your job. Um, in my opinion, training managers have, have not have not received the recognition they truly deserve, um, partially because of old people like me uh, that have been in this position for a long time and that are still part of your command staff. Um, uh, I was a training manager when training was easy, uh, when it was just a matter of some post compliance, a few classes, a lot of fun, uh, money was good back then, uh, budgets were, were very robust for, for law enforcement training. Uh, we got to travel all over the place, do a lot of fun stuff. Um, but over the years, uh, the regulations have hit us very, very hard. Uh, public scrutiny, uh, as we all know right now, has been very, very tough uh, on law enforcement. Um, the media portrayal of law enforcement has been difficult. And that really puts the pressure on training managers. We're going to talk a little bit about that and how you build your plans and how you execute that. So uh, poll is done. Uh, let's see. We have a pretty, pretty good... Uh, group here. Um, so we have a uh, 26% less than six months. Uh, so relatively new, 18% uh, less than a year. Uh, but half of you have been here for more than a year. So my guess is um, uh, you should probably be pretty good or probably have a good idea of your training and training plans and want to update on it. And um, 10 of you, 5%. Uh, uh, have answered yes to congratulate me. This is my first day or week. So 5% of you are brand new. Uh, we love you for being here. It is not that scary. We're going to talk about how to, to get through some of this stuff. It seems like it's dauntless that you've got just a ton of things to do and remember all at one time and you're going to get slammed with it and and probably the last training manager who heard that spot says hey listen i think we're close to being up to date and they walked out the door and then you never saw them again and they left you holding the bag so that's definitely how training managers uh, in departments usually go and again we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit too um trish can you can you deploy poll uh five for me uh please and as we're rolling these in well, that's good. I'm looking at a lot of people that already have an existing plan they're looking to update. So that won't be too bad. This will be pretty easy. Um, and we'll talk about how you can keep your plan up to date and, and you'll see as we talk a little bit later, it's a living document. And if you're not on it constantly, you fall behind it very, very quickly. Okay, so 34% of you don't have a current plan and we're gonna have to work on that. Um, it's, I'll tell you right now, it's very difficult uh, to, to, to be in compliance without having a current training plan. Um, and I, I was listening to, to Scott Savage uh, earlier and he's, he is absolutely dead on uh, when his point when he talks about difference between compliance and training. So we're gonna talk a little bit about, about both of those as we start putting our plans together and we start talking about a plan. There is a difference between compliance and training. And a lot of times um, we get lost into the compliance part of it and our admin staff gets lost in the compliance part of it. I mean, admin is very, very big on, on, on telling you that, yes, you need to be in compliance or we need to be compliance as a, as a police department or a sheriff's department. But a lot of times we forget about the training aspect of it. We figure out what we actually need to give our officers uh, and our, our professional staff. And, and when I say um, uh, our entire department. Uh, we, we're going to talk about how POST has evolved a little bit too over the years or how things have changed. And, and unfortunately, um, POST being a regulatory agency, um, really their, their primary concern is those that they regulate. So those in, in, uh, in their uh, 
or legislation, those that's in uh, uh, the post regulation of who they actually govern. And that's that's pr primarily law enforcement and, and dispatchers and, and records. But there's another group of people out there that often get left behind. And a lot of it's because of the change that we're having in, in law enforcement itself. So, all right, let's see. Okay, so uh, one of the things we need to talk about is um, uh, uh, defining your position and what you're doing. So people here with a lot of different names, we call people training managers, training coordinators, uh, training supervisors. I mean, there's a number of names that are given this position. It's really not a simple answer to it. It's really what you do and what your responsibilities are. And uh, those are, those. are that's really gonna make the difference in uh, um, what you what your job function is. Uh, some of you are are sworn. Uh, you're police officers. Some of your professional staff, um, and it's varied throughout the years. And that's one of the things that that has been unique with our profession. Uh, if you look at what you what you're doing now, and we'll we'll hit a poll in a little bit too. Um, most of these jobs were were in the past filled by police officers. They were not professional staff positions, and that has changed and morphed over the years. And that's caused some some conflict in how we do our training, how we assign people. Um, uh, it's made a difference in structure for organizations. Um, uh, if you uh, look 20, 30 years ago, you would not see civilian commanders. Uh, agencies in our region have civilian commanders. They, they have the rank of a commander for their agency, but they're professional staff. They've never, never carried a gun, never wanted to carry a gun, but they serve a very valuable role. Uh, that being said, they're not governed by post. They're, they're not part of their regulatory body. And then sometimes uh, they can't get into the classes. And, and a classic example is the post management class. And I know uh, it was talked about earlier about regulation and you've got uh, a year after you're appointed to be a lieutenant uh, in a management role to go this management class. That's great, but you know, what do you do with the civilian manager that has that same rank? that now is not eligible to go to a post mandated uh, uh, management course because they don't fall under, under post regulations. And, and we'll talk a little bit about that too, or I can answer some of those questions as you go along. So please feel free to, to throw them out. Um, Manny talked yesterday about uh, training and the changes that we have in, in training. Uh, and, and like I said, <clears throat> when I started this job and when I was a training manager and the things that I had to do um, as far as uh, staying in compliance and sending our, our folks to training um, was a lot less than what we do now. Um, really, when I started, uh, and I don't want to date myself, but you know, I went to the LA County Sheriff's Academy and uh, they were issuing revolvers at the time. And um, with that came your Sam Brown, uh, a couple of sets of handcuffs, uh, a side handle baton or a straight stick, uh, some spare ammunition, and that was about it. There, there wasn't a whole lot more involved now. Now we're talking about OC spray, we're talking about tasers, hobble devices. Um, the, the amount of training that you have to do just on the operational side is huge. Uh, now talk about the rest that's involved, the liability, the, the body cams, um, car cameras, uh, all of that compiles upon uh, what used to be, uh, you know, a 15 pound weight around your waist and, and your back to another another five pounds of just equipment. And with all that comes training. Uh, and that has complicated your jobs quite a bit. And, and I appreciate the hard work that you do for that. Uh, in this day and age, the public's asking much more for transparency. So understand um, everything that you do is, is discoverable. Uh, the PRA, the Public Records Act, is a very powerful tool. Um, so as you decide where you send people to training, um, uh, what their organization is, you will be held accountable for that in some manner. If you send somebody to ACME training um, and it's in um, uh, you know, a casino someplace and they never saw the training site whatsoever and nothing ever got done and an AR class they're giving you credit for was only two hours long, um, that can fall back on you. So it's really important that you look at the quality of your instructors and the content and the courses that you send people to. So, so again, a lot more to think about and a lot more in building your plans when you start deciding where I'm gonna send people. Um, you can't send them uh, blindly. And the last part I wanna talk about in this is, is you need to understand um, your role and your potential and what you do. So it doesn't matter what 
uh, your title is, it doesn't matter what they call you, um, you play a very huge role in your organization. And I mean a huge role in your organization. Sometimes um, some of your staff may not recognize that, or maybe they do, and they're just not acknowledging it. Um, but you have the ability to guide uh, your organization and what your people learn, um, uh, how they learn, and, and pushing them to the next level. Our goal has always been to be professionals and professionalize our training. Um, and that makes a big difference. And we'll talk about that a little bit later too. Are you really sending people a training or are you just trying to check the box? And I've seen it both, both ways. And some of it is out of your control. So I'm not gonna put the blame on, on our training managers. Uh, sometimes, and I've, I've talked to chiefs that have asked for training and they don't really want the training, they wanna check the box. And I've actually said no to a couple of them um, where they've asked us to come down and train. And I just said, no, I'm not gonna do it that way. And they said, well, we just, we just need to get this done. And I said, well, obviously you're not interested in training your personnel. You want to check the box. There are other organizations that will do that for you. Uh, we will not. That is not, not what we do uh, out of our group. It's not what POST expects from us. Um, so those are decisions you have to make. And sometimes those decisions are difficult ones. And we don't talk about that much when it comes to training and training managers, that sometimes you have to make that tough choice uh, or that tough recommendation that maybe some of your staff doesn't want to hear. So, um, We'll talk about that a little bit too. <clears throat> so in general, let's talk a little bit about types of plans. Uh, for those of you that are brand new, for those of you that have that already have existing plans, this is this is pretty much um, a repeat for you, but um, uh, maybe a good reminder. Um, what you definitely need is an annual plan and you have to start looking down the road of your training. Um, a lot of it depends on your scheduling. A lot of it depends on how you deploy your personnel. Um, some agencies uh, select uh, shifts every three months, some every four, some every six. Um, that all varies uh, quite a bit. Um, I've got somebody that doesn't have their mic muted. If you can mute it, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so when we talk about uh, your training plans, you need to look down the road for, for um, at least have an annual, annual training plan. Um, in that plan, you need to also designate your sworn and your professional staff. Now, again, as we talked about just a little a while ago, uh, POST regulates all of the sworn personnel and some of our professional staff, but not all. And what has occurred over the years is little by little, um, duties that used to be for sworn police officers are now professional staff positions. And that puts everybody kind of in this quandary of what do I do with this person? Um, Riverside, uh, is it Riverside? Riverside SO has that issue um, right now. And so do some other sheriff's departments where they have two direct paths um, or two distinct paths for their personnel. They have some that are jail deputies that will never ever see the street and they take one path and then some that do both. Um, what happens on the, the jail side of it is they move up through the jail side and jail is actually governed by uh, or regulated by STC. Um, and that's the classes there's, they want to go to. Um, and, and nothing on STC, but uh, POST seems to be the preferred training site and, and POST puts out some very good programs. And quite often they want to push people to the POST side of it. And that causes a problem for them. So um, uh, yeah, that issue, that causes a problem. And you're going to see that for, for agencies also. Uh, a lot of times um, you've got people inside your agency that are really fall under the STC side of the regulation, but you're trying to send them to post classes and that causes a problem too. So um, <clears throat> something to think about. Think of your part-time people also. Part-timers become full-timers. And although most agencies uh, don't like to pay a lot of money for part-time and not because they don't value them, a lot of it's because of budgeting, um, uh, um, but uh, yeah, that's that's exactly it. Um, what what happens with uh, with part timers is they kind of get left out, and you, you need to not not try to leave them out. Um, and uh, Post has some free training. Uh, there's a lot of other good free training out there, and there's some ability to bring training to your agencies, throw your part timers in there. Um, what I'm telling you is as a training manager, as a training coordinator, don't forget about them. Don't leave them out. They, they're very valuable individuals, um, but they kind of get, get pushed to the side sometimes. So if you can um, throw them in there. Um, you've got detail specific plans, um, uh, uh, detectives, traffic, uh, canine, 
uh, SWAT teams, uh, those are very unique in that they require specialized training and sometimes take their own track. And then you've got the folks that want to be a detective, that want to go to training, so they're looking for that. Um, and I know that that causes some issues too. If you've got people, you know, banging on your doorstep. Uh, and the last part is individual. When I say individual, there are some unique positions on, on agencies where um, although training is not mandatory, uh, it becomes uh, preferred. Uh, it becomes a pathway to promotions. And so, like I said, you controlled an awful lot on your agency on, on development and, um, you know, pushing good people toward uh, or, or mentoring them uh, toward positions is really part of your position, a part of what you should be doing. Um, uh, it makes a big deal. And, and on top of that, knowing your regulations and knowing what you have to do is going to help you quite a bit. And I'll give you a classic example. Uh, we have got a lot of new chiefs coming up, a lot of new sheriffs, and they're coming very, very quickly. Uh, for those you don't know, for a chief to get his or her executive certificate, they have to complete the executive development course. Um, and and um, <clears throat> a lot of, lot of chiefs don't know that, believe it or not, coming through. And at the last minute, they're scrambling to get it. You don't want to be that training manager that forgot your chief, right? You should know that if you have a captain, they're promoted to chief, that you want to send them to EDC, the executive development course, so they can get their executive certificate because they're going to want that. And it's in your best interest to be ahead of the game. So, hey, uh, Chief Smith, hey, congratulations. Um, so you know that uh, to get your, your executive certificate, you need to go to EDC. Would you like me to schedule you for that? Um, it's a busy class. It's full almost all the time. Um, getting there, your boss in sooner rather than later is a feather in your cap. And that's, that's something that's important for you as you try to uh, maneuver your way through uh, being a training manager slash training coordinator. Um, <clears throat> let me see if I can, we're not moving. So let me ask you this, is this something that you're looking for? And uh, you can hit it in the comments. So this is kind of a sample training plan, um, kind of rolls out uh, what we have here. Um, if not, then I'm not gonna worry about it, but it seems like that for some of you that are brand new, this may be something that you're looking for as far as your training plans. Can I get a yes or a no in, in chat? Um, so I kind of have a general idea. Wow, a lot of yeses coming out. So this is our percentage of brand new ones, uh, it looks like. I'll give it a second. Christine, Trish, are you counting this? Because I want a number at the end. Yeah, we're on it. <laughs> oh. Easy. All right. So. Uh, this is actually part of a seven page document on a sample training plan that's been developed over the years. Um, we're going to make that available to everybody. 1995 free shipping. That's all I can say. Can I do that, Christine? She's rolling. She's rolling her eyes. I can tell what they've yeah. rolling eyes. Yeah. We will make this available. So it's a seven page document. Uh, we will link this or post will have this on their um, link after this conference. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's in word format. Um, it's very, very simple. This is something you need to build on. It is not meant to be a catch all. Um, uh, look, so Norris is free. Not 99. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes, it's free. Um, it's not meant to, 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 to be a catch all for everyone. And some plans are much more detailed. Um, and, and I'll tell you the problem I have with more detailed plans. It's, it's a lot more to deconstruct. And you can see as quickly as everything is changing, new laws, new rules, um, uh, it, it gets very, very complicated. So we, we have tried over the years different plans. Um, I like the simple plan. It's a lot easier. And then it's something to add on. So <clears throat> when we talk about this, so let's, let's do this real quick. And I just like to see. So a police officer recruit lateral first year. Um, other than what's listed on there, what else do you put on there? Or what else do you mandate, um, not by statute, but what else do you mandate from your agency in here um, for your first year cops? See if we can scroll some answers in here. Uh, 
So we put Narcan in there, SIMS and in-house scenario training. FEMA, IT security. A lot of OSHAs, yes. So I saw one that says Marine firefighter. And again, and this is why we talk about training plans are, are very individualized. Um, you know, if you, if you are working someplace where there's no bodies of water, um, Marine training does you no good. Um, we've got DAs for DAI school. Um, we have some corners in there. It's good. Sexual harassment HR requirements. Good. So what we're touching on and what we're looking at now is, and and as you can see, what's coming through bloodborne pathogen, um, what you're seeing is a lot of different classes or schools that aren't post classes, and that's something to remember too when you're building your plan. So those of you that are brand new at building plans, um, post sets minimum guidelines for law enforcement but there's so much more involved in training and building a training plan. And what you're seeing is the entire list of what people are willing to, or, or sending their officers to. And you can see, this is a long list. This isn't a short list. <clears throat> Somebody asked, is there a specific list for DAIs? There is a DAI school. Nice. Okay. So a lot of people are, are upping their training. Now, <clears throat> don't feel bad if your list isn't this long. Uh, your training plans and lists are going to be regulated by your budget and uh, your staffing levels. Um, uh, what I found it was interesting uh, when I took this position here was the, the, the depth and the breadth of different agencies throughout the state of California that I never thought about. Um, uh, uh, some agencies that uh, um, uh, have a lot of money that are smaller, that have uh, the ability to send a lot of people to training. They send the people to a ton of training. Uh, one of my last agencies was like that. Uh, was not as busy an agency as my first, um, but they had money and they they valued their training and they had an entire um, uh, shifts training. You know, twice a month you'd have uh, uh, training groups uh, out in a lot of classes and people got to go to training. Uh, other agencies, not so much. Uh, there are some agencies, you know, with a half a dozen, dozen people on it. And to get them to get to go to training, to, to get them to a spot is very, very difficult. So um, that's why this is kind of a really very skeleton of a plan. But the hardest part that, that I think most training managers have found in putting a plan together is sitting down and starting it and what kind of a skeleton. You can do it in a Word document. Um, you can do it on a spreadsheet. I don't do spreadsheets. <laughs> uh, Rachel in my office loves when you say spreadsheets, she gets all excited and just starts making spreadsheets. Um, it's really how you want to do it and what your um, uh, what your ability is uh, for an agency to send people to training. So um, uh, again, uh, it varies quite a bit. Uh, we will make this available to everybody. Um, uh, so please don't worry about it. Um, it's only 1995 for Redondo Beach PD because I saw them here. So uh, yes, you know who I'm talking to, um, but we will charge you for this one. But everybody else is free. Um, but Ron, <clears throat> there was a there was a question that was relevant to the slide you have up. Um, it. It's asking whether the mandatory that's listed on that slide are those post requirements or agency requirements. Those are agency requirements. So and again, we didn't list on here the post requirements because it's easy to find the post requirements by going to the post website. And I know that was covered in a different uh, uh, seminar. Um, this is what, what I as a training manager would say is mandatory for my agency, for my officers or my staff, we'd write mandatory on there or mandated or desirable of, of what we wanna see people go through. So um, I, recommend it, I recommend you do it that way and let the regulations speak for themselves. So, um, you know, somebody put stop the stop the bleed training, or uh, and, and for some agencies, um, they mandate that the minute they get out, they send people to that. Um, for instance, when I first made sergeant, uh, after you went to super school, uh, mandatory was IA school and civil liability. W w that's just what you went to, um, and some agencies are like that. Um, my last agency, SLI, was mandatory. 
uh, our, our sergeants, once they promote it, actually signed a paper that says, hey, uh, yes, I'd like to be a sergeant. And these are the classes that I'm willing to go to uh, with this agreement. So for that agency, uh, SLI was, was mandated training, um, but it's not a post mandate. And, and that's why I don't want people to get too mixed up and, comp and um, lost in that because there are so many different mandates for what we do. And that's what's really confusing for training managers. Post has mandates. Um, if you have interaction with the jail or supervise the jail, STC has mandates for that. OSHA has mandates. Um, there, there are other things that, <clears throat> depending on, on what your operational plan is or where you work, and I'm not familiar with this, but if you're uh, at the beach or working over bodies of water and you've got people in boats, I'm sure there are Coast Guard mandates for that also. Um, so those are, those are the things that um, you've, you've got to think about. I just saw a quick question about uh, section requiring a chief to attend the executive development course. They're not required to attend the course, but if they want to get their executive certificate, they need to attend the course. And I almost guarantee you they're gonna want that executive certificate. They may not know that. And, and you're the rock star when you send that memo up to the chief and says, hey chief, by the way, you're eligible for the executive certificate after a year of being a chief, but you must attend the executive development course. Would you like to do that? I will bet money you'll get a gold star in that one. And they'll say, oh, thanks, I appreciate that. Yes, I do. Can you sign me up? And you're good. And it just, I mean, that's your job. You you should be on the ball for that, but that's going to help you out. Christine, are there any questions that I miss, missed on that one? Um, no, you're good. Okay. All right. Uh, anything else before I move on to the next uh, slide on that and take another quick poll? All right. Coming along here. All right. So. Training plans. We're going to talk about training plans a little bit and, and why we do this, and and, um, uh, and we covered a little bit of this already, but we'll we'll get into the weeds a little bit. So, uh, purpose of training plans in general are are your long term planning. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's difficult with everything that's going on right now um, to figure out. Okay, I've got Officer X that does A, B, C, D, and E. Officer Y that does th these other things. What do I do with them, and how do I ensure that they're in compliance? And, and the uh, answer to that is, is training plans. The answer to that is, is putting something pen to paper and writing down exactly what you, you need. Um, and, and so, you know, um, uh, I'll let everybody on, on, on this know when you're on Zoom, if your camera is on, uh, just so you know, we're seeing everything that you do. So I'll just give that as an FYI to our audience out here. Um, but, um, Long-term planning, uh, control and continuity. Uh, you have complete control over how you direct your staff and you wanna make sure that you're doing the same thing. Again, uh, when we talk about this and uh, uh, we're gonna talk about the liability involved in this, you're liable for this. This is your responsibility. Um, you may not have to pay anything personally if you get called into court, but there, there is a very good chance at some point in time, you're gonna call into court, you're gonna get called for a deposition and you're gonna be asked to explain why you did or did not send somebody to training. Right, so <clears throat> um, compliance, I know Scott talked about the compliance and training, but compliance is extremely important. You've got to comply with, with post regulations. You have to comply with STC. You have to comply with your policy. You have to comply with law. Um, and something we'll talk about a bit later, um, uh, and I won't forget when we talk about policy, but your policy has a lot to do with your training. Uh, and we'll, we'll delve a little bit deeper into that in, in a couple of slides. Um, but so compliance is important. You need to know post law, post regulations. You need to know what's going on uh, uh, throughout the state and nationally. And you need to see what's coming down uh, down the pike. Um, training plans make you more productive. You know, obviously, once you write something down and and have it on pen to paper, that's kind of half the battle. And that's where I think most people struggle is um, is they don't have a written policy or at least a skeleton. And that's why. Uh, for those of you that have really uh, detailed policies, that's great. And if that works for your agency, um, uh, that's best for you. But uh, for the like 43% that don't have a plan at all, take the basic plan um, in the Word document and just start going through it and putting down what you think that you need for um, uh, your staff and, and your officers. And that's going to give you a good starting place so you don't forget things. That's what you don't want to do is forget things. Um, that becomes a, a big part of it. 
uh, <clears throat> this, this term has been brought up quite a bit, evidence-based training, evidence-based policing. Um, know, know why you're sending people to things. Uh, a lot of times uh, officers want to sign up for stuff and, and I hear it all the time because it looks like it's fun or it's, it's at a good location. Um, that's not a reason to send somebody to training. And, and uh, when you build your training plan, we're gonna talk about deployment. We're gonna talk how that makes a big difference down the road in your long-term planning and what you do with, um, with your plan and how you, how you uh, construct it for your officers. <clears throat> Last part is what is your role? What is your role with everything that you're doing? Um, are, you, are you just the coordinator? Do you just um, uh, uh, schedule people for training or are you actually managing uh, the entire training department? And it's gonna, and it's gonna vary. Everybody's in a different spot I, and I get that part. I, in this room, I probably have some command staff that are the training managers and they make that ultimate decision. They decide where everybody goes. Uh, I've got some folks probably in here that are line level, uh, either on the sworn or the professional staff side that they only make recommendations uh, and they don't get to pick a lot of different things. Um, but what I'm telling you, and this is, this is the most important thing I think for you as, as, as training professionals is you need to define your role and what you do. Don't let the role define you, okay? Um, and what I mean by that is it doesn't matter what your title is and it doesn't matter what you not sure what you're supposed to do, especially if you're brand new, um, you need to cut your own path with this. Training is, is extremely important. We take it for granted in California. And, and I've been very fortunate that I, I got to go back East. I got to go to the National Academy. I got to see what other agencies do and how they train across the country. And when you see that, you understand why the, the, the public in, in a national level is very upset with law enforcement. Um, the, the kind of training they do or don't do is incredible. There are large agencies out there that still don't have official field training programs. They basically get through the academy, uh, they get signed up, they get paired up with a, a person uh, for a short amount of time and they're good to go. Uh, we did some work back in Chicago not too long ago um, and uh, I was listening on the radio and their commissioner, which is their chief, said that, that year they were gonna increase the department by a thousand officers. And I looked at somebody in the class from Chicago and I said, how are you gonna hire a thousand officers uh, for this agency? I go, how do you get them through the academy and through training? And I said, what is your attrition rate through the academy? And he looked at me kind of funny, he says, we really don't have an attrition rate. Kind of if you get into the academy, you're gonna make it through. And I said, well, what's your field training program like? And he kind of looked at me again, well, you know, we parred you with the senior person. So a lot of the things that we take for granted that, that we do on a regular basis, and, and thank you for all of you that are still doing this, they're not doing it across the country. And, and um, I don't know what they do for training. I don't know what they do for training managers or, or training supervisor. Some of them because of their size, some of them just because they don't have the money. Um, uh, I was at another agency too, and this was years back, but uh, they were asking for extra money because at their sheriff's department, it was a small sheriff's department in the Midwest, um, they didn't have any fingerprint uh, equipment. They didn't process uh, 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 burglary scenes for fingerprints. So you can imagine the kind of police work that was being done there. And this is within the last you know, 10, 15 years. Um, uh, and, and you're right, uh, somebody put California is different in its police training but we're not judged by California standards, we're judged by national standards. And, and that's what people look at. So um, somebody said, has a post got an FTO program? Yes, uh, we do have an FTO program and POST does have a very good FTO program that, that's, that we all have been a part of for many, many years, um, but other agencies and other, other states don't. And, and, but what I'm telling you on this, I don't wanna to get too far off topic is you need to define your role and what you do. And you have a big role in your agency. Um, uh, Trish, can you deploy the rest of the uh, 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 surveys for me, please? So let me ask this question. Let me see what we get out of this, this survey here and see how this goes. <clears throat> see who's in the room. Folks are coming up. We should be done pretty soon. Except for those that fell asleep. Got it. All right. So 31% of you are professional staff, 69% of you are, are sworn, <clears throat> and that number keeps increasing every year. So uh, uh, training manager's job has traditionally been a, a sworn position. 
um, uh, agencies are moving much uh, uh, or understanding that it's better to move it toward a professional staff position. I know some different people may have different opinions on that one, but um, the, the truth of the matter is putting somebody in a position like this for a long period of time is much better than for a short period of time. Uh, in the past, it used to be uh, you're going to be the training manager. You do it for two years and you rotate out. Well, two years just happens to be the amount of time for uh, your perishable skills. So what happens is somebody gets through perishable skills in their two years and then they toss it off to the next person. Hopefully um, they're starting all over again and it just becomes a, a kind of a nightmare. Um, I find and I have seen from agencies where they have permanent training managers that they have uh, more robust training plans and programs. Not always the case. I'm talking in generalities. There are some that are very successful in rotating positions, but for the most part, it seems to be um, uh, uh, staffed or the professional staff seems to have a better handle on some of the long-term uh, planning and the long-term uh, um, uh, plans that are out there. <clears throat> Trish, can you uh, hit the next one? Kind of a nice thing about, uh, and I'm not a big proponent of uh, Zoom meetings or Zoom seminars, but <clears throat> every time I take a drink now, you guys can't tell whether it's just water or an adult beverage of some sort that I'm drinking, which is nice. <laughs> uh, all right, let's see. 88% full-time, 12% part-time. So part-time positions are tough. It's tough to be in this in a part-time position. This is really a full-time job for an agency. Uh, hopefully, if you're in a part-time spot, there's a full-time person backing you up on this and you're coordinating part of it and you're working as a team. But if you're only part-time doing this, um, yeah, that one's that one's tough. I I would I would um, yeah I I would uh, I would look at your agency and have that discussion. I actually had a discussion with the chief um, about a year ago uh, in one of our local agencies, and uh, that was one of one of his issues. Is he had uh, he was his training manager was a sergeant. Uh, they rotated in every couple of years. Um, they had um, uh, they had a difficult difficult time keeping up with training, my recommendation was to staff a full-time uh, uh, professional staff person in there. And I, I know he's pushing that plan forward. Um, there are a, a number of issues involved that I can tell you from, from the operational, from the, from the admin side of it, is creating a position with HR and the city is always a, a, a fight. Uh, classifications, dealing with the unions, um, there's, there's more than involvement saying, well, I'd like to just make this a, a full-time um, uh, professional staff uh, training manager spot. Uh, there's a lot of, there's sometimes there's negotiation that go involved in that, but um, uh, operational wise, it seems to work better. Great. Um, Trish, can you hit the next one? And here's a big one. <clears throat> In different training um, groups, uh, they'll vary depending on the size of your agency. I mean, obviously, if you have a, a, a like LAP, if you've got an agency of 10,000 um, uh, or close to 10,000 uh, sworn personnel plus your civilian staff, um, you probably have more than one person <laughs> as you're training, uh, involved in training. You probably have several and several different groups. And that poses some problems also uh, with agencies. Um, and they're a little bit more complex. Most of this is geared toward, uh, you know, smaller, mid-sized agencies um, uh, who don't have the same resources that some of the larger agencies have, <clears throat> but it still becomes a challenge. So 58% um, in a permanent spot, that's great, uh, and that makes this much easier, and 42% in a rotation spot. So those of you in the rotational spot, it's like, all right, can I get through this and then screw the person that's coming in behind me? Is that pretty much how that works? Because it was like that when I was working. It was, can I get through um, uh, what, what I'm doing? And, and when you're doing a rotational spot, you know, hopefully um, that, that doesn't become a, a, you know, I'm here just to be in compliance, um, but it, it becomes one of, you know, training and professionalism and professionalize the organization. And, and when I talk about, don't let this, don't let the role define you, you define the role. 
that's what you need to take your bosses. You, you need to talk about, you know, hey, I'm in charge of training. I'm building this training plan. How do I execute it in two years? And their answer is you really can't. It's, it's long term. Um, and, and not that um, uh, uh, you may or may not have a say in it, but it is in your best interest, right, to at least, at least, at least talk to somebody about that. Um, you know, work, work hard um, uh, at defining your role and don't let that, that role define you, right? So that's, that's, that's really important. Um, Trish, can you get the next one? Somebody wrote that their small department and um, uh, they can keep on top of the, the admin work, the staff work, but getting in with the officers is another thing. And we're, we'll, we will touch on that a little bit and I can answer some of those questions. I, I have now seen it from, from both points of view. I have been that officer going to training where literally uh, as before electronic TRRs, they had to pin the TRR to my shirt because I didn't know what I was doing and why I was there. I get that part of it, so I do understand that. Um, we have some great people that come to training ready to learn. We have others that show up without a pen or a pencil or a piece of paper and you think, why are you here? Um, so I, believe me, I understand your frustration. And I've also been in your spot where you're trying to get people to go to training and it's like pulling teeth. Uh, and then uh, now I'm sitting in the spot now where I see a, a much bigger picture uh, or, or for you SLI graduates, the, the view from the balcony is, is higher up here and I can see a lot what's going on down there. So 43% um, <clears throat> of you in here are supervisors, 28% managers and 29% line levels. So um, when you're building your plans and you're trying to execute them, uh, my recommendation is you team up with either the supervisor or manager. Um, it, it makes it difficult sometimes uh, when you don't believe you have the authority uh, uh, to, to force people into training, to send people to training. Sometimes that becomes uh, an organizational issue and something that you need to discuss with the supervisor. But it only happens when you discuss it with the supervisor. Sometimes I've heard agencies, well, I sent somebody to training, but they didn't go. And I think, well, how is that an option? If you assign somebody to training, they're getting paid for it, they're on duty, how is that an option? Um, uh, and, and some people are lost on it. And, and the real simple answer is, and I'll give you the, the admin answer to that. Well, the first time you give somebody a written reprimand for not showing up to training uh, will probably be the last time they forget to show up for training. Um, can, can officers forget to show up for their briefing? Uh, can you forget to show up for your shift? I don't think so. Um, training is no different. It's part of their work. They're on duty when they're there and it's their responsibility. But um, if anybody has an issue with that, I can, I can work with you, uh, on the side, just, just let me know. Um, and we can talk about that too. Um, any questions so far on, on training plans, what we, what we've talked about? Seeing none. All right. <clears throat> so we'll talk about designing a plan a little bit. Um, I got to ask her by, by policy. Um, I, somebody put herding cats. I use that phrase a lot. Uh, I believe that's, you're absolutely right. The getting officers training sometimes is like herding cats and, and getting their paperwork. Um, yes, I understand that part of it too. Again, this is not just designing a training plan or, or, or develop a training plan. This is execution also. The development is the easy part. I send you the document. You start working your way through it. We'll tell you the best way to do it. Um, the rest of it is is getting the end to it. But here's something you need to pay attention to: policy. Um, I, I real quick, uh, give me a yes. How, how many of you are part of Lexapol? A lot of yeses coming in. Some people with a big exclamation point, like they're really happy about it. It's great. Okay, <clears throat> so all these Lexus yeses for Lexapol. Lexapol, and I'm I'm not here to. Um, endorse uh, any um, private organization, uh, whether it's a, uh, whether it's Lexapol, whether it's a, a training group, whether it's, um, you know, anything at all. Um, I'm here just to kind of give you the information. Uh, uh, Lexapol uh, is good for what it does. Lexapol uh, puts out a good policy and a generic policy, but it's up to individuals to go through it all the time. And, and, and I've got nothing against Lexapol. Bruce Prate actually teaches for us for one of our classes and, and Bruce has been a friend for many, many years. 
<clears throat> but in lexable policy, you need to make sure that you go through it because through that policy talks about mandatory training or training that's mandated per lexable. If you leave it in there, make sure you're doing it. And, and that's really all there is to it. And it's in there. There are parts of the lexable policy that talks about training and you need to make sure as a training manager, you're in compliance with that. If not, you need to pull it out and you have that option, right? So um, it's a pain to go through and it's a lot of reading, but um, as a training manager, uh, training supervisor, training coordinator, that's what you need to go through. That's extremely important that you you look at, at your Lexapol policy and, and make sure that the, your compliance with, with your own policy, because that's what it is. Are you in compliance with your own policy? And that becomes a big thing sometimes. Um, <clears throat> Post and STC. Post and STC are regulatory bodies. And remember, great organizations, uh, I love my folks at Post, love folks at STC, they set minimum standards for this profession. And again, minimum standards. So uh, think about that when you're complying with, with Post. And, and the classic example, there's nothing wrong with setting minimum standards. Um, people get twisted about that sometimes. They don't like that word minimum, but that's their job. Uh, they're they're um, responsible for regulating well over, what, 400, 450 um, uh, law enforcement agencies throughout the state, uh, not, to, not to mention the other ones that, that are, are part of POST or not um, frontline law enforcement. Um, they set those standards. Same with uh, STC. So... Um, <clears throat> Uh, you need to follow uh, and understand both uh, post and STC um, uh, requirements and make sure that's part of your plan. Uh, you need to follow the legislature. Um, and, and if you're not up on current events, uh, it's going to bite you in the butt in the long term. And that's a big part of, of how you design your plans. And Scott mentioned it, SB 230. We'll touch on this toward the end of, of the presentation. Um, uh, literally, we put on a train the trainer class for SB 230. Uh, half of the class uh, did not understand what SB 230 was. Two of the members of that of that class thought it was just a use of force de-escalation and said, "I don't need to know about SB 230. I just need to know about use of force and de-escalation." All wrong. And I don't know how they got into the class or who sent them, but somebody did not read the legislation. And I said, hey, listen, just read SB 230 and understand why you're here. Um, and this was an instructor's course. So again, uh, I, I share your frustration, but it is, it is incumbent upon you as a training manager to take that professional role and understand what SB 230 is, right? And understand the legislature, what's coming down <clears throat> and what needs to be done. When you design your plan, you should do a training needs assessment internally, right? Um, Somebody asked, what's the best way to keep current with new legislative standards? It's read. Post has it. Post puts out uh, uh, training bulletins all the time, reference that. And the rest of it is, is, is educating yourself on this and following it. Uh, Cal Chiefs follows all the, all the important legislation in there. Uh, somebody put in their CPOA also, um, and um, <clears throat> they're good at that. Uh, next part of what we're talking about is a training needs assessment. You need to do an internal training needs assessment. You need to figure out from your own organization what your training is. Somebody asked in here, what's the best way? And you beat me to the punch. The best way is talking to people. You need to talk to your admin. You need to talk to your different groups. Of, you need to find out what are, what are their needs. Now, it doesn't mean because they think they need it, they're going to get it. Um, that's something that you need to have that discussion with your training staff. If you're a training staff of one and it's you, and we'll talk about how to work your way around that one, but that's what you need to figure out with. You need to talk to your command staff. And when I talk about defining your role and don't let the role define you, I know professional training managers that have been in their position that started as basically coordinators that now sit next to the chief at the management meetings because they're deciding where the department goes to training. Now, it didn't happen overnight happened over several years, but literally, and I know this chief, this department, I know this chief personally, and his comment to me constantly is, whatever blank this training manager wants, that's what this training manager gets, because that's how heavily he relies on this person to make those decisions regarding the agency, because that training manager is up on everything, up on current laws, up on regulations, reads constantly about uh, what's the next thing that's coming and tries to predict down for the future. That's part of your, that's part of what you do for training needs assessment. So it's really getting out of your box. And for some of you that are brand new, I know it seems very a very daunting task, but it's really not that bad. 
you know, people will, people will help you out with this. And, and Ralph just put on their uh, uh, post, post month reports, another way to keep up on legislatures, right? A lot of what's going on out there. So you really need to get out of your office. <clears throat> Side with your, your training needs assessment, you need to think about your best practices, best practices in law enforcement um, uh, throughout the state and the community standard that's being, uh, uh, that's being um, um, kind of driven in, in your region. And that, which leads me, the next one is, is training managers meetings. If you're not part of a training group or training managers uh, group, you should be. And before, I'm gonna take a, a quick break here for a couple of minutes, but Trish, can you deploy the, the um, uh, uh, survey on uh, training groups? Almost done. So less than half are part of a training group and attend regularly. Now I understand, um, you know, COVID has killed uh, our, our meetings. Uh, we see, do some on Zoom and they're not as, as effective, but <clears throat> more than half of you are not attending a training manager's group regularly. So that's tough. Um, I'll tell you to be successful in this position you really need to do that. And I, I can't stress that enough. Um, uh, training managers groups and the network is going to be your lifeline for doing this. If you're brand new at this and, you know, if you're especially out of that, that first, that 10%, the, that, that, that congratulations, this is your first day or first week. Um, that's going to be your lifeline on, on getting through all of this. Um, you know, I always tell people, you know, uh, the, 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 it, I always told people, you may be smarter than one of us, but you're not smarter than all of us. And that's what it really becomes, right? So, um, you know, you can, you can do a lot on your own. There's some very bright people out there and you can probably survive, but um, you'll be treading water out there. The, the training groups are truly gonna be your lifeline on this. And we're gonna, we're gonna talk, talk, touch on this a little bit more. Um, we're gonna take a quick break. Um, any other questions I can answer on this, Christine, that I should hit right now in kind of mid slide here? Uh, no, we're good with the question. Okay. All right. So let's take about a 10 minute break. Um, we'll get back and finish up. If you've got additional questions, please fire them off toward me. Um, and I will see you in about 10 minutes. Good. Thank you, everyone. So welcome back, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you for those that returned. For those that didn't, you escaped. Good for you. you made it out. Um, Christine, were there any other questions? I know one of the questions that came up is, is finding you the training uh, managers groups in your region. And uh, Christine mentioned that it, it, it is on the, you can access it through, access it through the uh, uh, post portal. But the, I think the easiest way is to ask your LEC. So every, your, whatever region you're in, I would ask your LEC. <clears throat> <clears throat> and your LEC is a great connect. I mean, they're not just the, the person. I'm not saying this because Post is here and regulating me and they have a shot caller around me if I say anything off, off key or off color, but they really are a good connect. I've, I've worked with a number of LECs throughout, throughout the years, um, not just in my region, but through a number of projects with Post. And, and I've never had an issue or problem with the LEC. Um, uh, we've always gotten along great, at least on, on my point. Christine hates me, but that's a whole other story altogether. But I'm not even your LEC, so let's come on. I know, but you know, just in general. Um, <clears throat> I'm just kidding. Uh, but they are a great connect, and that's they're a great source of information. So, so don't don't uh, don't underestimate that. But um, I'll tell you, your your training managers meetings, your training manager groups are ones that's going to help you through a lot of what we're talking about here, and and not just in the designing of the plan, but the execution of the plan also. And, and unfortunately, we're doing this via Zoom, and our the last training managers conference was, was great. Hopefully, we'll have another one um, uh, when COVID is done. But being able to pick up a phone, I know definitely in, in our, our region, um, oh, <clears throat> definitely in our region is is an absolute uh, is is one of the best things ever when you've got uh, you know two people left that miss perishable skills you need to get them in and for us in LA County if you can call up Rio Hondo and you know George over there and say hey George I got two people that need to get in can you get my people in and he goes yeah absolutely because you have a personal relationship with them that's exactly the way to do it and and that's what a lot of this is about is making those contacts um, you know as well as I do. This is a this is a very tight knit group, and if if somebody doesn't know somebody else, they know someone that knows someone else. And 
uh, we're all interconnected somehow. Um, you know, we were just, we're delivering a, a class out for Riverside Sheriff's. And I'm not, in, well, that's not our region. I, although we service them, I'm not out in Riverside that much. And one of the captains walks up to me and it turns out he used to be uh, LA County Sheriff's deputy. And when I was a DI at the Academy was one of my recruits. And now he's on their command staff at Riverside. And that's, you know, it comes full circle 30 years later. Here's somebody popping up from my past, um, uh, making a personal connection. You're gonna find that constantly through this. And I'm saying this primarily to the folks that are brand new. Um, some folks are, are brand new coming in from the outside um, and, and it's very intimidating. And we have them at our, 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 our training managers meetings. Uh, we get brand new uh, training managers all the time and they're always a little nervous, a little scared. And then they find out that, you know, this is a great, they're a great group of people and a great resource. So um, um, definitely tap them when you're designing your plan. They, they'll let you know the mistakes they made, especially the ones that have been there for, for many, many years. They can tell you the mistakes they've made in training and, and trying to deploy a plan. Um, and when you're designing a plan, you also need to, to separate your mandated, your preferred, your desired training. And when I say mandated, um, again, two types of mandate. There are the, the post mandates or and the, the statutory mandates that we have to, to adhere to, post mandates, legislative, whatever the case may be for any of that, um, those are all mandated training. But internally also, you may have uh, traditionally from your agency things that are mandated for training. Um, and we talk about best practices, for instance, um, uh, Narcan is uh, that popped up in one of the uh, 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 chat boxes. Um, you know, if you're in a region where uh, there are um, a lot of overdoses and Narcan is used quite a bit, you don't want to be the only agency that doesn't train your people in Narcan. Uh, and, it, and it may not, that may be out of your hands. That may be your, your admin may say no, but it's up to you as a manager, as a professional to make that recommendation is, hey, listen, um, just so you know, uh, all these agencies in the region went to training managers meetings. They're all training in Narcan because of the uh, high opiate use in that. Um, this is my recommendation for our personnel. That's the best practice. That's, that's adhering to your community standards and that should be built into your plan. So again, there's so many different moving parts in this. Um, and like I tell people, it's not hard, it's just a lot of moving parts, a lot of organizations. So um, that would be something that I would, uh, I would recommend um, uh, when you talk about your training managers meetings. Um, <clears throat> last part is video training. You know, Post has come a long way in uh, allowing a lot more things on their portal. Uh, don't, don't overlook video training. And in the time of COVID, I know that has come up quite a bit. Um, COVID has really, uh, um, uh, really made it difficult for, for trainers. And we're gonna, we're gonna cover that in a, in, in a slide or two, um, but we'll talk about it. But don't, don't forget video training, uh, briefing training. Again, your job is not just um, to be compliant, right? Um, your job is exactly that, is to train. And there's opportunities to train. There are constant opportunities to train. You just need to decide if you and your unit are gonna be on top of that and whether or not you're gonna put that out. I mean, does everybody have five or 10 minutes in briefing to do some sort of training? Um, some of the training managers I know they've been doing this for a long time, they throw it out there all the time. And it's a lot of repetition. Um, you know, having me a cop at one time and, and knowing cops, yes, it is like herding cats. Yes, it's difficult sometimes. And you repeat it over and over again. And you wonder, am I getting through um, to these people uh, that, that I'm serving? Um, and you, you may not know, um, but then again, uh, there's that there's that diamond in the rough out there. There are the people out there that you just constantly push forward, and and work on. Uh, don't be discouraged. Uh, not everybody's going to come and tell you what you did a great job. Not everyone's going to tell you that this is the right thing to do. You have to decide as a training professional: is this the right thing to do? Right. So <clears throat> think about that. Any other questions on designing a plan? Crickets. Okay. So we're going to talk about assigning courses and let's talk about figuring that out. Um, <clears throat> uh, one of the things you need to do is you need to define your positions and positions are different for every agency. And again, um, you know, when you're in a region, you think this is how the rest of the world works, the rest of the state. Um, that's, that's not necessarily the case. So you need to define your positions and, and um, you know, in some agencies, they're lieutenants and some agencies are commanders, some agencies are captains. Um, it varies. Uh, some agencies have, you know, deputy chief, assistant chiefs, 
Um, it varies throughout um, uh, throughout our state. So you need to define your, your positions when you start assigning courses out. We talked about the internal training needs assessment and we talked a little bit about how to put that together and how to work on that. Um, but the bottom line is you have to get out of your office and you've got to talk to people. You've got to talk to your command staff. You've got to talk to, to your specialty details and ask them, hey, what are you looking for in training? What, what, is, you know, what is mandatory for you as a canine, right? Or what is desirable? What is by policy regulated for your canine? Do you have to train once a month, twice a month, um, internally, externally? Um, look at your policies on that and then um, get their suggestions. And then, and then you can see, again, you control that. That's a, this is the stuff that you do. Budget is gonna restrict what you do and, and every decision you make, I'm telling you right now, and this was from uh, a chief that teaches for us, every decision you make is a budgetary decision. Not just on the dollar amount for your training, but the ripple effect throughout the agency. That means pulling that person off of shift. Well, you pull somebody off of shift, is that gonna cause overtime? Or does that short your shift enough that now nobody else can take the day off. So when somebody does the take day off, that causes overtime. Um, so there's a ripple effect for, for training and uh, scheduling. That's something you've got to work with through your staff and your personnel. Um, <clears throat> one of the, the things that comes up quite often and it comes up from officers is, hey, but post pays for this training, it's free. Um, two things, there's no such thing as free training. Somebody is paying for it someplace. Um, uh, and the other half of it is a lot of times reimbursements don't go back to the police department, they go back to the general fund in the city. So I can tell you as an administrator, it's structured that way. Let's say you've got a training budget of $50,000. Your city council is counting on that $50,000 coming back to the general fund. And that's what they use quite often um, as kind of, uh, I guess the, the inappropriate term for, for finances is, is a slush fund, but it really pads their budget and they like to see that come back to them. So sometimes that becomes an administrative decision on how that money is spent. Um, but don't, don't let that slow you down. Um, uh, Post does reimburse for a lot. And there's a lot of uh, uh, training that is literally no cost to you. And that's what you have to look at too. <clears throat> Post is, is funded right now. Um, there's a lot of the training out there that they are paying for or, or not charging you any kind of tuition. And they're reimbursing you for, for travel, for lodging. Um, some of the ones that have been out for quite some time is the principal policing. Now, people are looking for procedural justice and implicit bias courses, and they're desperate for it right now. POST has been running this program for at least three years under a plan five, which was no cost. Um, and now that it's, it's hit the, the front page, <clears throat> agencies and command staff are struggling to get their people into it. Um, when I can tell you in my region, we've been telling our folks um, for years now, get it, get it now. It's free. It's it's not charged, costing you anything, and we have the staffing for it. <clears throat> What's happening now, and what we're getting hit with is everybody wants this training all at once, and now it's creating a backlog for it. So, having that training plan, it, that's how important it is. Um, if if you had built this plan three years ago and you're paying attention if we something some of the things that we talked about a little earlier and you're seeing what's coming down in the legislation and you're seeing what's happening <clears throat> these are things that you should be prepping for these are the kind of things that you should have all lined up and and ready to go and start putting your people into so which brings me to the next bullet point is proactive versus reactive training so uh, what we're talking about now is reactive uh, people are reacting to implicit bias and procedure justice training and they're trying to get people in. Agencies that were proactive or training managers that were proactive with this got this done already years ago. Uh, I know one agency where their chief put this on his plan when he was an interim chief, and it's probably one of the reasons why he, he got the position was, um, you know, was able to demonstrate to a city manager and city council that he put his entire agency through uh, procedure just and implicit bias training before it hit the news and cost him absolutely nothing except for the time it took his, to take his personnel there. <clears throat> That's a huge win for a command staff. That's a huge win for you as a training manager. And again, when I talk about defining your position, that defines your position. That no longer makes you the person that's just in compliance 
and and is trying to keep up with regulations but now you're thinking like a manager a supervisor and now you're planning ahead of time and you're getting your personnel trained way before everybody else that's a feather in your cap and your agency's cap that just demonstrates your level of professionalism and your ability to pre-plan those aren't done without training plans because you you need to have all your your brick and mortar things things done you need to have all your basic compliance things lined up and then now you need to find time for this, right? I mean, that's a big thing that occurs all the time. Legislation passes, things occur, and all of a sudden something else has to come in. You had the next six months planned out for training and schedules and they drop somebody drop something else on top of you and now you need to find a spot for it. If you don't have a plan, it's gonna be that much more difficult um, uh, for you to get into that. Um, <clears throat> what you need to do before you send people to training is understand the courses. Um, for those of you that are brand new in this and have not been to any training courses, you need to schedule yourself for some of them, right? How do you send somebody to a class like procedure justice, uh, implicit bias without having attended it yourself? Now, I know you're going to tell me you don't have the time to do it. I know you can tell me it's difficult. Um, you're right. Uh, it is difficult. You're right. We don't have the time to do it, but you're going to have to find time, right? How do you how do you know what a good class is unless you've attended it? <clears throat> Have you been to an instructor development class? Do you know what a good instructor is? Do you know what a good training is? There are tons of training out there. Besides regional centers, things that post, there's, there's private trainers out there. Some of them are do great jobs of training. I would recommend them all day long. Others, I, I have questions about. And uh, Post sends out their QAP constantly to try to regulate that. Um, you need, but you need to decide for yourself what good training is. Don't just go because you know, somebody uh, uh, has a great website or somebody you heard this was a great training. Um, why are you sending people if you don't know for sure, right? So um, understand the training and what you're going to. If you're a training manager and somebody asks you uh, what principled policing is or perceived justice and implicit bias, you should know what that is before you send somebody to that. So uh, think about that when you sign courses out there. Um, are you training or checking the box? And we touched on that a little bit earlier as you build your plan. Uh, yes, building a plan, a big part of it is compliance. Um, and you need to keep your people in compliance. Uh, that is important. But are you going to be that person who just wants to check the box or are you going to train? Uh, are you going to be a, are you going to be that consummate professional? And that's what we all strive for. And that's what we hope our training managers become are those professionals that care about not only the people that they're sending, not only the officers and professional staff, but do they care about the profession itself, right? Are we making our agency a better place? Um, know about that when you assign courses and you don't know that unless you understand the training. <clears throat> I see very few training managers willing to spend the time to go to instructor development class to understand what a good training class is. They'll, they'll just send people and, and, and Scott Savage said it earlier, it's because we've always done it. We've always sent people to these classes. Well, maybe you should look in there and, and take a look at, at um, uh, what you're sending people to. <clears throat> so executing a plan, and this becomes a little bit more um, difficult sometimes. Um, you definitely need your agency support. So again, you need to get out of the box. Uh, building the plan itself is not gonna help you unless you've got agency support, unless you're talking to your command staff, unless you're talking to your supervisors, unless you're talking to your team. If you're not a supervisor or a manager and you're in charge of training, you have a boss. That supervisor, that manager, you need to ally with that person. You need to make that person understand that it's difficult, if not impossible, to do your job unless they support it. And then you'll know where you stand with that, right? Um, <clears throat> connect with your regional resources. We talked about training groups. Um, they're, they're going to help you quite a bit. And some of your other, um, uh, <clears throat> some of your regional resources are some of your regional training sites and, and getting to know them and not just your training groups too. Um, for us uh, in this region, uh, besides us, there's Golden West College and Rio Hondo. Um, uh, both support police academies. Uh, both of them um, have a number of different programs and they're good places to connect with. So make sure you do that. Uh, don't forget your LECs. They're people just like everybody else. They have a big job and some have large, large areas to cover. Um, they're, not the, they're not the bad guys. They really aren't. And, and I say that because I give them a hard time on a regular basis, um, but they're there to help and they want to see you uh, uh, um, progress and do a good job. So um, they're very good at helping you execute that plan. They're very good at helping you, at directing you to what good training is. 
but even when an LEC tells you they think something's your training, go look for yourself. <clears throat> it's one of the things my boss has taught me a long time ago when I was in operations, when a citizen complained about a parking issue uh, someplace else. And uh, one of my staff would say, yes, there, there's a parking issue. Well, that's great, but I like to go look for myself. I'll drive up there, look for myself. So when that citizen calls me and says, hey, this is a problem I'm having, I can answer that firsthand. So for you, if you attend some of these classes and not all of them, but if you attend some of these classes, you have a good idea what groups are like. And if you know, if you attend, you know, XYZ's training and you see the, the quality product they put on, you'll know whether you should send somebody else there too. As we execute plans and as we draw them out for the, your entire agency, um, decide what is your plan B. And what I always tell people, life is about plan Bs, not plan As. If my plan A worked out, I would have been both Iron Man and a cowboy, but that didn't work out for me. So I ended up in law enforcement instead. So, um, you know, think about that. What is your plan B uh, uh, in, in, in your training group? Uh, there, are, there are things that are gonna happen to you. Um, and the biggest one right now is COVID-19, right? COVID-19 COVID hit and, and halted training for two, three months. Um, some went online, some went back to regular training, some went back to limited training with limited uh, uh, personnel. Um, it's, it's been tough all over and getting compliance has been another part of it. And I'm not going to cover all the compliance part of it, um, but I'll sum it up in a nutshell for those of you that didn't, didn't um, make it some of the other seminars. Uh, neither post nor the legislation can wave a wand and say, you no longer have to be in compliance. Um, uh, state regulations, statutes, the rules, those are the rules, uh, we're forced to follow them. Now, are the mitigating circumstances? Absolutely, absolutely. If COVID-19 shuts down any kind of in-person training and you can't uh, complete your perishable skills, that's an acceptable reason. Now, that being said, <clears throat> will that get you out of a civil suit? Will that get you out of any kind of litigation? The answer is probably no. For those of you that, that have not been in a deposition, um, they're not fun and they really don't care why you didn't get something done. The question will be is, um, you know, uh, hey, Ron, you've had two years to complete perishable skills for uh, arrest and control and you did not do it. And my answer will be, well, a COVID-19 hit. Okay, well, that covers the last six months. What did you do the other 18 months? And we'll have that kind of silence in the room. It's, it's. Yeah, they, they, they're, I don't have a reason for that. I should have got it done earlier. So you need to have a plan B. Um, you need to get these, your compliance out of the way as quickly as possible because new legislation pops up all the time. SB 230, principal policing, um, AB 392, um, you know, mental health, uh, de-escalation. All these things start popping up um, uh, and it makes, it makes it very, very difficult for you to execute that plan. Um, I see some of the questions popping up about racial profiling and the museum of tolerance. Um, I can answer that in a nutshell. I know they get answered for somebody else. Um, museum of tolerance right now is the, is the sole provider for um, uh, racial profile training. I know POSA is working on some alternates right now. Um, it is not their desire to be shut down. Uh, Rachel Salamanca, who is a law enforcement liaison there, we've talked to her because uh, uh, Museum of Tolerance is part of the SLI program and that comes through us, um, they're shut down by their admin and they're shut down by, the, by LA County. So um, I, know, I know it's frustrating and they're working on it to get that done. Um, they would open up in a heartbeat if they could right now. Um, talked to Rachel just about a month ago and she says, we are trying. She has begged and pleaded, but uh, their hands are tied. So they answer to somebody else. So just an FYI on, on that. Um, but so plan B, extremely important, uh, something you need to think about, something you need to work on. Um, uh, uh, again, I can't stress that enough. <clears throat> Some of the things you need to, to consider, um, uh, your budget, uh, obviously. Um, uh, I don't know if we, did we deploy that question, Trish, on the budget? I don't think we did. Or did I even have it? I don't recall a budget question. Yeah, I don't see a question regarding budget. I had it on there. You guys just erased it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
you're right, Ron. You're totally when, right. When, when in doubt, blame post. That's kind of my boss. Yeah. That's yeah. Oh no, they're listening. I, I'm sorry. That was for them. <laughs> Hopefully, I thought they were muted. But when in doubt, blame post. No. Yeah. So, the, the question I would have, and, and I should put that poll out there, is: Do you know your budget? And if you don't, you should. Right. So, if you don't know your budget, you should know your budget because that affects everything that you do. Um, there's a cost associated with classes. There's a cost associated when you want to send somebody away to training or find local training. Um, uh, you should you should definitely uh, know your budget. <clears throat> um, when you're sending people out to training, are your results measurable, right? When you send somebody out to training, what are you getting back from that? Hey, it was good training. Uh, we went to the eight hour class. So when they get back from that, how do you know? How do you know it was good training? Um, you know, what, what, did, what, what came out of that? Um, uh, uh, you need measurable results. What are your department goals? So all of your training, because it affects your entire agency, should be in line with your departmental goals. If, if one of the goals for your agency is to connect with the community, and, it's, and, and most do have a, a great deal of wording there about working with the community, does your training reflect that? Is that the kind of training you're sending people to? Are you only sending people to compliance training, tactical training, or are you sending people to, to the training that's meeting department goals. And that's a big thing. Don't, don't not think it's important. And please write this down is, is take a look at that. Is what I'm doing in my training plan in line with department goals? Because if it's not, at some point in time, it's going to come crashing down around you where your boss is going to walk in and say, hey, um, uh, uh, our goal is A, B, C, D, and E. Have we been sending our people to those classes? I can guarantee you they're not going to know only you will and your answer is going to be yeah I, I i don't know chief and that's not the answer you want so make sure that that you're lined up with your department goals which is really funny because i know and actually me this says don't you just love it when your chief or command staff goes away to a training session or or to a conference is that not your favorite thing when they come back because what happens right some new form of training shows up Right. Something else is, hey, I went to this, I went to this the seminar and conference and they talked about this brand new training. Uh, we want to send all of our people to it. And yeah, somebody said they come back an idea fairy. Yeah, that's that's true. They have a ton of great ideas. So you have one or two choices at that point in time. You either suck it up and go to your plan B and screw up your entire six months of scheduling that you had just done to send your people, or or you go to your boss and say, hey, boss, by the way, this is what we have lined up. This is aligns with our department goals, right? What would you like me to change on this? And then they stop and they think, okay, wait a second. Um, let's see. We want to connect with the community. We've got every signed up to a coffee with the cop. Um, do I want to not do this so I can send them to this um, UAV training? Right or um, uh, you know uh, ATV training or whatever the case may be that uh, that your chief or command staff came back with. Um, what am I going to do? How am I going to how am I going to stop them from doing that? Because that uh, that is effectively going to affect your training plan and your training deployment, and that's going to mess that up. Right? <clears throat> Play the long game. Right? You need to think not two years down the line, but five years down the line. Don't think compliance right? Think training. Think about, um, think about your goals uh, for your agency. Think about uh, what's best for the profession. Don't just think compliance. Don't just think two years at a time because you're going to screw yourself with that. Think two years come up very, very quickly and you need to make sure you have those contingency plans. Um, what are your agency community issues and things that we talked about? Uh, you know, if, if you've got a uh, High, high case of, of opiate use, then you know maybe Narcan training's uh, very, very effective for you. Um, uh, whatever, uh, if you have uh, 11 550s uh, walking around the street all the time, maybe you're officers in 11 550 training. Uh, if you don't have that and, and you do, did a survey and your agency or the public came back and says, hey, we love what you do, but we just like to see more contact with the police. 
do you need to send your cops some more communication training and, and help have them help them work better with interacting with the public? I mean, those are all those are all extremely important um, aspects of your training plan and things that you need to start thinking about. Um, <clears throat> Oops, last one. We're almost done. Uh, we're almost done for questions too. So we're hitting the last 15 minutes. So some of the things to start thinking about, and this is what I want to start thinking about uh, for you as training managers and, and the things that you do. Um, you need to take care of yourselves. And that's one of the most important things that, that hopefully I can put out. You do a great job. Um, you work really hard at what you do. And, and I truly believe, and not all, not all, but some agencies undervalue what you do and the importance you play. You really have the opportunity to direct what your entire agency does. Um, but you have to define that position. You don't don't let them define you in that. Um, you're an integral part of that organization, and um, what you do has has quite a bit of meaning. Um, but you really need to start thinking about that, and you start thinking about as you define that position, um, your opportunities in your in your positions, right? And part of your training plan, and part of what's on your training plan should be your training. And don't forget that. What classes should you be going to? And should you make time for yourself? If you're an instructor or if you're running training or if you're hiring instructors or appointing instructors or monitoring um, classes that you run at EDI, have you been to an instructor development class? Because how do you know what a good instructor is if you haven't been in instructor development class? So if you're a training manager and you, and you have classes in EDI and you do internal training, you should absolutely go to instructor development class because you should be first and foremost on determining, hey, uh, Ron Mark is teaching this class. Is Ron doing the job he's supposed to be doing? Is he doing a great job, right? That's, that's, a, huge, that's a huge part of what you should be doing um, and you should be training yourself in that. So don't, don't leave yourself out of that. Uh, I know sometimes they're difficult to get into. Um, we run those classes. They are plan fives. Um, I will always make room for somebody in a class. So any of our training managers, I, it's always it was it's always open. If you want to sit in a class, if you want to come into a class, um, come on in. Uh, we'd be more than happy to have you uh, as part of it. Um, if there's a if there's a um, tuition for it, don't worry about it. We won't charge you or your agency. Um, I want to see our training managers get get what they need um, uh, and and that's knowledge. I mean, um, if you're sending, if you decide down the road, hey, maybe I want to send all my people, all my sergeants to an IA class. Uh, is it of any value? Come to an IA class. Come, come sit through it. Um, uh, if it's in our region, if it's ours, definitely get you right in. Even if it's in one of our, with one of our neighbors, uh, uh, Golden West or Rio Hondo, I can't speak for them, but I'm sure I have pretty good relations with them. Um, they would allow training managers in at, at no cost. Um, we really want to get you uh, up and running with, with some of this. So, um, Please uh, um, uh, take care of yourself, and, and uh, I appreciate the job that you're doing. Uh, Christine, do we have questions out there? Or does anybody have any questions on anything we've covered so far? There was a request to get some samples maybe posted with your documents from your class. So as long as you receive, Ron, maybe permission from those um, agencies, we can post a couple of those along with the documents that you are going to post for your class. Okay. Yeah, I think that would be a great idea if, if we could all put them um, uh, together. Um, we disseminate it definitely. I mean, in our region, it's open. We've exchanged uh, uh, training plans for quite some time, but you know, obviously it's nice to, to reach out to everybody else. Um, but yeah, I think that's a great, whoever put that out, that's a, that's a great idea. Um, somebody asked if, if classes are suspended uh, till 2020. No, we're running classes. We're up and running. Uh, we are... Um, uh, supporting first responders. Uh, we practice all the social distancing. Um, there are online classes and, and there are some great online classes. And there are some that in my opinion are marginal. Um, online learning is, is difficult and it's difficult with cops. Um, let's be honest about it. It's, it's hard enough with, uh, cause I do work on the campus side too. It's hard enough with students. Um, you know, some people excel at online learning. Others uh, like me, uh, I need to be in a classroom and I need to see people with that. So. Um, uh, please uh, uh, choose wisely. Uh, pick pick ones that are um, um, 
that are good for you and good for your agency. Don't don't discount them. Uh, we are looking down the road at maybe uh, putting some together, uh, working with Post on it. But right now, our classes are are in person. Um, we have a number of them, and and don't forget about them. Don't forget on some of the things that are up and coming. Uh, I know that um, uh, uh, Scott mentioned uh, SB two thirty. So SB two thirty is uh, these are Post programs. Uh, we are running the train the trainers for that. That's a use of force de-escalation on the FOSS VR machines. Post is putting out about 75 of those machines throughout the state. Uh, we're traveling to Monterey next week. Um, no, that's not our FOSS VR class. That's a different class. Um, we, we did uh, one down south here. We'll do a second one in December. And then we're taking that class on the road. So um, I'm working with Post to find out best locations in the region. Um, so if you're getting a FOSS VR machine, uh, we're getting that to you as soon as possible. But again, read SB 230. Literally had people in this class signing up to be instructors that didn't know what it was. And that's a problem. Uh, it's not a standard use of force de-escalation class. It does cover that, but it complies with legislation. Same with AB 392. So um, uh, uh, somebody said, uh, being so far now, it's a good four or five hours to drive to get to anything in the Bay Area. We'll move most of these. We'll move classes around as much as we can. Uh, we're a little bit slammed right now because we were shut down for almost three months, and we're trying to catch up. But we are back in person, running classes. Um, if it's on our website, if it's on the post website, um, uh, we will uh, we'll try to get that out as as quickly as possible. And if you've got requests, please let me know. My information's up here. Uh, again, I can't I can't thank you enough for the work that you do, um, and I really truly mean this. Training managers, you need to take care of yourselves because you get forgotten quite a bit. Um, you need to go to classes. Um, uh, you need to go to some of the wellness classes that are out there, at least to see what you're, what's what's being put out there. So, so take advantage of that while you work for an agency, while they're willing to send you. Um, uh, and if I can do anything personally for you, um, please let me know. Um, my slides will get posted. Is that correct, Christine? Yes, um, there's a couple questions that if you could just maybe cover quickly before we end. Sure. Um, there was a comment or question about whether the training groups, the training manager groups, if they're separate for district attorney investigators or um, do you find that most of them involve the DA investigator training bureau? So I can't, I can't speak for other regions, but for LA and Orange County, which is eight, eight and nine, right? Are we eight and nine, those two regions? Nine, 10. Nine and ten. So nine and ten, the DA office, the DA, the DAIs, DA investigators attend those training managers meetings, and that would be my recommendation. If they have one on their own, I, I don't know. They may, um, um, but um, there are some, and that's the other thing I found out. You know, like LA County has a huge, huge DAI group, and there's some throughout the state. They're very, very small. But my suggestion is they should also attend the training managers group. The the the, the amount of information in there is just. Is, is astronomical besides regulation, but what's coming down the pike, resources, um, you know, some of the things that we didn't cover and I don't wanna go into to take up, uh, I have a few more minutes, don't I? Um, uh, uh, a lot of people have dual roles of uh, not only training managers, but recruitment and hiring. And a lot of that's passed around in, in these meetings. Uh, we talk about that in, in nine and 10 in our meetings about recruitment and hiring open positions. Um, coming from a school, some of the other schools are there. Uh, we have students that are looking for jobs. Uh, a lot of them have gotten jobs or, or, or uh, you know, been eligible and, and are now either cops or dispatchers or work someplace in the agencies. So, um, uh, yes, take advantage of that. that that's that's going to be your main resource. Okay, there's like just a couple questions about posts that I can answer. Um, and then, Ron, there's a question about where people can find SB 230, train the trainer courses when they do come out. Um, I assume the course catalog will post them, but you will also have your own flyers. Correct. Putting out. Correct. For, so the SB 230, it will be in the in the course catalog. Um, I think the, the one that's up there right now is there's one in December down in Orange County. So if you're in our region or you're close and the rest of them, we will start moving around. We're going to try to do at least one a month uh, uh, starting January. Um, I'm working together with uh, um, uh, Post and uh, to place exactly where those need to go. So um, they're looking for regions where the FOSS VR machines are going first, and then we're trying to place those classes central so it's easier for those folks to travel um, uh, to get to that class. A couple of questions that have come through about when the next Post training managers course will be. 
Um, we've obviously have to cancel everything this year. So our goal would be to start those back up in 2021. Um, and our vendors for that are Santa Rosa Junior College and Cal State Long Beach. So those are the two locations you'll want to be checking their websites if and when those training manager group, uh, courses will be announced. And then there was an interesting question about, you know, will POST ever provide recommendations of, of how many training coordinators or personnel an agency should have based on maybe the number of uh, personnel they have. Um, POST probably will not do any type of recommendation for that. Um, there are obviously some managerial studies that you can request from POST that could include your training bureau, but again, that would come out of our management counseling uh, bureau and I'm not sure that our bureau that deals with the consultants will do that. Ralph, if you want to add any more on that. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Yes. Um, uh, so there's a couple of associations uh, that you can get information from. One is International IACP, International Association of Chiefs of Police. And the other one is uh, Police Foundation. And they both have those kind of recommendations for you on the aggregate. So you can use that as a, as a guide. Um, okay. But every situation is different. We'll come back on for focus. Hello. Go ahead. Somebody okay. had a right. so, so, and 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 the reason you can't give a definitive answer on that is because it depends. It depends on the jurisdiction that you're in. Policing is a very local uh, entity or business, just like uh, politics and real estate are, are local businesses. Uh, you can have a population area of 10,000 that could be in South Central LA, and they could have another population of 10,000 that's up in Arcata, and they're completely, completely different policing and uh, uh, regions that require different resources. So you have to be careful with that, right? So anyway, I would say uh, check those two resources out, and hopefully they'll be helpful for you. Thanks. Okay, Ron, do you want to post the slide? Yes. And do you know offhand um, the the FOSS VR what manufacturer? I don't. I, so so it's not the, out of our bureau, so I don't know. Yeah. So for the FOSS VR machines, same thing. We are we are not involved in it. Um, the FOSS VR, um, we're responsible for the content of the training. Um, uh, <clears throat> when post, when you guys, uh, when your other bureau sets out the phosphor machines, um, I believe the manufacturer is coming behind to do the training uh, on the machine itself. But we're, we're responsible for the content for the SB230 class, but not the, um, not the machine itself. So the, the last thing I want to add to everybody. So um, when this slide is posted on the very front is uh, all of my contact information. Um, if there's something that, that we can do for you, either myself or our organization, you know, personally, professionally, please, please let us know. Um, you know. Because we're affiliated with the college, we have that, that advantage, whether it's, um, you know, pursuing your, your bachelor's degree, master's degree, um, training, whatever the case may be. Um, I, I really, really want to make sure that, that these resources are available for you. We run a number of other programs, both for crime analysis and CSI. Um, there's, there's a lot of opportunities there. Um, there's a lot of bodies. We, we have internship programs. If your agency is looking for interns, um, uh, hiring, um, a, lot of, a lot of students nowadays, they don't know where cities are. They, they, and if it's not in their little uh, world or bubble, they don't, they don't understand that. And we, we're trying to push them out and um, uh, you know, pairing good students to good agencies. Uh, and that includes post. I mean, if we can send somebody somewhere um, that needs a job, um, um, uh, we pick some good spot. I, I hire out of, out of our, our, our staff, out of our students. I pick some of our best ones that work in our office. So um, if I can help, please let me know. Okay, there's the survey for your uh, CPT credit. Please fill that out so that you can get CPT credit. And our next workshops will be starting at one o'clock today. So thank you for attending. Ron, fantastic. I mean, I just can't even tell you how fantastic that was. <laughs> thank you, Trish. Thanks, Ralph. Thanks all post personnel on the call. Um, and have a great lunch, everybody. Thank you all. Thanks all for the support. Thank you, Christine, Trish, Ralph. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you all. It. Ron, great job, buddy. Thanks. I uh, hope to see you before the end of December, man.
Uh, I'll be up there. Okay. I'll be up there. I'll come say hi. So I'm, uh, I'm out December 31st, so we got to get a cup of coffee or a beer before then. Yeah, uh, let's do it while you're working. That's the most. <laughs> At that point, you here. probably can. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to make you guys mad, but technically, I can. There, I'm not restricted. Yeah, to. I'm sure you could. I can they? They serve alcohol on campus. It's it's incredible. It's, it's literally outside my office. They have beer and wine. Come on down. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks, everyone. Oh, you guys are funny. <laughs>